Why am I going to talk to you on this subject? It's some, I, th I think it's fitting actually, that we revisit why we spend time around the scriptures. I think it's important that we are able to vocalise why we spend time around the scriptures. And I think it's important that should we come across someone who is thinking about their commitment to the scriptures, or whether there is an interest in the scriptures, then we can say why it's so important that we take the scriptures seriously. So I'm starting from that standpoint. I understand I've got a largely Christadelphian and Christadelphian derived audience. So I'm coming at it from this point of view. This is why, this, this is why I believe. And, and these are examples of why, I can't say for these very reasons, but essentially, I sort of thought, what, why is it that I spend Sundays like this? Why am I willing to go and do stuff for the Christadelphian Ecclesia? This is why. There, there are a number of principles, and I've identified three what I would call pillars of my faith. So the first is creation. And we're going to have a little look at each of these. Not a long look, but a little look. And then the Holy Scriptures themselves, why they are worth taking seriously. And then... Prophecy. Well, we speak loads about prophecy from this platform, and I think you can look in YouTube and find even more. But I've got a slightly different take on that, so forgive me. Um, and essentially, all of those, for me, in my own simple and very limited way, explain why I take the scriptures seriously. And I want to just walk through those now, if you will bear with me. So, we've already read... If you come to the psalm reading that we read this morning, um, it's Psalm, psalm 7, I think it was, Psalm 8. And we read there, when I consider, this is verse 3 of Psalm 8, when I consider thy heavens, <coughs> the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So this is the psalmist considering the creation, the world that surrounded the psalmist. And he says this in Psalm 19. He takes it one step further. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And my viewpoint, rightly or wrongly, but this is where I sit, you look at the magnitude of the world, the systems that are in it, and the system within which the world sits. And it is beyond my ability to understand that they've arrived at and that they exist as a consequence of chance. There's an eminent scientist, Albert Einstein, and there's a lot of text on that screen, but that's what he thought. So this is Albert Einstein, who was a scientist of scientists. I am not an atheist, he said. When he considers the whole world and everything, just as the psalmist did, he said, the problem involved is too vast for our rather, mind more than others, limited minds. And then he gives you this simile. We're in a position of a little child entering a library, a huge library filled with books in lots of languages. The child knows someone's written these books. He doesn't know how. He doesn't understand the languages which they're written in. But the child has an awareness that there's a, an order, a mysterious order, in the way the books are arranged. But he doesn't know what that order is. And so it seems to me, he says, the attitude of even the most intelligent human being toward God. We see the universe marvellously arranged obeying certain laws, but we only dimly understand these laws. So that's what Albert Einstein had to say. I think the psalmist said it better, but Albert Einstein says it all the same. And there's a basic corroboration. Let me give you a little bit there. He talks about the universe marvellously arranged and certain laws. Here, here's a nice picture. It's an American picture, so it's slightly simpler than most pictures. But there's a little annotation in the top right. You can see the big words, and I'm sure Toby and the muckers of his age group could tell you that that says the water cycle. A basic principle which you're introduced to, I think, at primary school, 
um, and beyond in greater detail, we can see that the, the statement there in the little text at the top right says, you may think with every drop of rain which falls from the sky, glass of water which you drink, it's brand new, particularly not in London if it's come from the Thames, but it has always been here and it is part of the water cycle. So when God created, as I would believe, the world, he made just enough water. There's the same amount of water now as there always has been. It's a closed system. If there's a bit more water, there might be a bit more of a problem. It moves around different states, but fortunately, by chance, we have something called precipitation. Otherwise, it would all be in the air and nothing in the ground. And you can see all the different little principles there. Runoff and, and springs and seepage. If one of those processes didn't quite work, the whole, the whole system would be stuffed and you'd end up with lots of water in one state or steam, vapour or ice, as the case may be. But fortunately, it moves around unimpeded. And whilst people in the northwest might be seeing a lot more water than normal, I know that David Hunt, as a resident farmer, would complain that he still probably hasn't got enough, certainly on this east side of the country. And therein lies the dilemma of man. But that is the way the system works. And the complication to which Albert Einstein alludes is overcome. So, the Bible tells us that it is God who makes the clouds. He makes them rise at the end of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain over Trent Bridge. And he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. But the point is quite simple. It is God. It's not something that has arrived at by chance. One little bit of that system, it would come crashing down. But fortunately, God designed it this way. Now, that's my approach. You can take it a bit further. There's a lot of debate about climate change. We can sit on the fence. We can, we can sit on either side of the fence. But there are, again, basic principles. You could call it the carbon cycle. Here, it's called the oxygen cycle. It was a nice, simple thing. All living things need oxygen. Okay? Inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide. Plants just so happen to take in carbon dioxide and they, and they expire oxygen, which is so fortunate because if there were an imbalance, then life and the source of life is threatened. But we've got just enough. The problem we face in the 21st century is that man seems intent on producing more carbon dioxide, releasing that into the atmosphere and unbalancing that system. But we'll leave the politics elsewhere. But the science is fairly well established. So we have a system there and another system. You overlay the two and they work quite nicely because the movement of water sometimes helps the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. We're not here for a science lesson. The point is that there's system upon system upon system, dependent and interdependent, the complexity of which I struggle to understand as a result of chance just as the psalmist did. Now, again, we have plenty of lectures here about things, living things, um, their arrival or their defeating of chance, okay? And, and, and we talk about evolution and, and creation quite regularly. So here's, here's my very little take. Um, again, it's a very simplistic one, and it's not done to overburden the audience. I'm making a point here about the complexity of life and my, my position as a layperson aligning with that of Albert Einstein and agreeing with the psalmist. So, when a kangaroo is born, it's not very big. It's the size of your thumbnail, most likely smaller. Okay? So, so it emerges. It is born, just as most mammals are, but it has to find its way along. So, it, it, its destination is a pouch, and in its rather um, newborn state, it can neither see nor hear, and yet it needs to find its way to sanctuary in a different place. Now, a lot of this is without the mother's awareness. She isn't aware she's given birth, and she's not aware that this little joey 
the size of your thumbnail is, is migrating around its fur. And this process can take between three and ten minutes, open brackets, if successful, close brackets. And then it finds its way into the pouch. Fantastic! And there are four teats in there. So, lo and behold, it could have some competition. The, the, the joey doesn't have four teats by accident. It has multiple pregnancies all the way along. So it can have lots of babies on the go, and it can have, have um, various teats occupied by different aged joeys. And the, and the blind and the deaf thumbnail-sized baby kangaroo needs to accidentally find the right one. One would presume that if this didn't work successfully, reproduction wouldn't work and you wouldn't have another kangaroo to try again. That's where I'm coming in. So that process goes on for about six months where it starts hopping out, going having a bit of fun, um, probably playing cricket bad badly just to keep that analogy dragging on painfully. And then <laughs> we, we, can, um, we can move on so that the, the joey eventually doesn't return. But all of this is working on the basis that as the big one gets out, it doesn't knock the little one all over the place and out and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the whole situation is confused further because the kangaroo will have two wombs on the go and, and perish the thought that that's a reality we'd like to even consider. But there is another difficulty added to the equation. So quite simply, the kangaroo is continuously reproducing. I should have added the word successfully <laughs> because we get generation of generation after generation of kangaroos. But somewhere along the way, if we were to think about evolution, it wouldn't have happened right first time. And I don't know where that leaves you because once, once you apply that principle just to kangaroos, you can take it a little bit further within the whole scope of different organisms that reproduce successfully. So again, the complexity of that which I've just talked, talks to me about a designer, a creator. It leads me to the conclusion that we have recorded in the Genesis account that God created and it was very good. I need draw no other conclusion. And for me, the scriptural account, as we have it, with creation in six days and the seventh day of rest is all I need because if we understand that God created all of this, he's way better than me. He has an unlimited mind compared to the limits of the mind of Albert Einstein and myself. So I am quite happy to sit here and say that I look at the world around me and I see a creator. I don't see a theory. If we look at Romans in chapter one, this is what we find out there. Find in verses 19 and 20, this is taken from the ESV. For what can be known about God is plain to men. God has shown it to them. His invisible, in, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Mankind is without excuse. You look at the world, you see its contents. They've been evident since creation that God created. So if we see this, that for me is sufficient. I don't need the other two pillars to my faith. But I want to move on. I want to talk now about scriptural authority. Okay. I'm going to talk about the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a sequence of facts on that screen. The history is well established. Just before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, some Hebrew divisions were persecuted. And a group called the Essenes migrated to the south and they established their own community. The relics, the findings of that community became evident in 1947. Now, what was evident once the findings of this wandering shepherd were, were, were researched? A huge volume of material within 11 clay, clay, caves, clay jars, scrolls, documents. 
What we found within those documents are records of scriptural content. Pretty much every book in the Old Testament bar that of the book of Esther. The entire book or prophecy of Isaiah, pretty much word for word. These predate the text which we used to drive forward the majority of <coughs> scriptural translations that we have, and yet they concur. So they're a thousand years older. Importantly for me, they predate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we find? What was said? Here we have the, uh, the, the findings of a bloke called Gleason Archer, which has to be an American. Um, and he's responsible, eminent scholar, for various Bible translations. But what does he say? He says, even though the two copies of Isaiah discovered in Qumran Cave 1 near the Dead Sea in 1947 were a thousand years earlier than the, day, the oldest dated manuscript previous known. I'm repeating myself. They proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text, 5% variation of obvious slips and variations in spelling. So if we take this, something which was written before the birth of Christ as being accurate and consistent. The Dead Sea Scrolls, we're told, proved to be a significant discovery. They confirmed the preservation of our Old Testament in an accurate manner, particularly the messianic prophecies of Christ. The Bible's claim is that the scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That's a New Testament claim. But the Old Testament is full of records. God said this. God said that. The word of God came. The Bible's message consistently, New Testament and Old Testament, is that the words are God's words. We now have some authentic proof that those words are consistent and unchanging, that the words we read in our English versions concur and align with those early Hebrew texts. We know that they are authoritative. They speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have records of such documents before he even existed. For me, the quality of that is huge. I don't need to say much more, but that evidence of the authority of the scriptures supports, supplements, and, and further concrete evidence is produced as to why we should believe the Bible. The third point is one of prophecy. Okay? Now, I'm trying to make this really simple. As I said, the challenge is to be able to vocalise your own belief, to understand your own reasons for belief, and to see if they are something that you can share with other people. Or if you're young and, and understanding why you come to the Scriptures, well then you can see if any of this is logical to you as well. So now I've put something up there which talks about the prophet's test. The Old Testament set down, as it were, rules and regulations as to what is and is not the word of God. So when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word doesn't come to pass or come true, that's a word that the Lord hasn't spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You don't need to be afraid of him. So it's a simple rule of thumb, isn't it? If somebody comes along and says, so-and-so says this and it doesn't happen, well, so-and-so is not much good. But if so-and-so does say this and it does happen, and it happens time and again, then it's something of note. Deuteronomy records that that is the word of God. Now, if we look at the Gospel of John, we see something there. And I think this is really important because we understand that that Deuteronomy text is accurate. We understand that it hasn't changed from before the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the records that we have in the Gospels are records of people who understood those Old Testament scriptures. And the people who heard Jesus come and they say, John didn't do any signs, but everything that John said about this man, the Christ, well, that's true. 
So John appeared to these people as a prophet and they are running the prophet's test by him. And the prophet has come along and he said stuff and it's happened. Everything about Jesus that has been said has come true. And we have a record of what the people thought. Many believed in him. So if many were willing to believe in John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the subject of John the Baptist's talk, well, that's good enough for me. But we can look a little bit further. And, and this is where I'm talking about prophecy in a slightly different way. So the prophet Isaiah said, he said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Call his name Emmanuel. And then we record in Matthew chapter 1. Joseph, son of David, don't fear to take Mary as your wife. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. So there we have the words of Isaiah being approved and authorised in the Gospel of Matthew. We have that as a factual occurrence of what, a, what, a, what, the, what, what occurred at that point. Now, in putting these scriptures together, the intrinsic way that they are weaved together, the prophecy, the fulfilment, and the verification with the reactions of belief and affirmation are, for me, further evidences themselves of the authority of the scriptures. We could look at many, many other aspects of prophecy, but I just want to draw occasion to this now, because for me it's these little details that add fundamental substance to the credibility of the scriptures. So, I have another example, and then I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Quite simple, this is the prophecy that is very familiar from Isaiah 53. It will just have been sung a lot of times in the Messiah, having just passed the end of year festivities. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And Matthew records the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's accused, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Jesus remained silent. Now we could go through the Gospels and we could count the amount of times that prophecy is specifically directly referenced. This occurred to fulfil the scriptures. Or we could look at the um, indirect references. The numbers in total are huge. They're not accidental for me. They authenticate the proof that the scriptures are, as they claim, the words of God. Now, I just want to talk about Paul the Apostle. We read 1 Corinthians 15. Now, Paul had this to say about himself. He establishes himself as an eminent legal Hebrew being. I, I was, he said, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. Zeal, a persecutor of the church. To righteousness under the law, blameless. So, this is a man whose credentials were, were beyond compare. He had the legal background of a Pharisee. He had the zeal, the enthusiasm, the position as a persecutor of the church. He was right. He'd never done anything wrong. He was without blame. So the understanding of Hebrew law was key. If we go to the Old Testament, we note that the principle of the Hebrew law is that you have to have two or three witnesses to make, make a legal conviction. One man and one occurrence or, or, or one, one witness was insufficient. 
So we have two or three. And that's exactly what happened at the Lord Jesus Christ's trial. He was convicted on the flimsiest of flimsy evidence. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. So even though the Lord Jesus was convicted on the basis of liars pretending to fulfil the obligations of the Hebrew law, they weren't very convincing. So you would have thought that if you were getting into a legal trial, you would at least try to, to be um, with some conviction as to presenting the same, even if they were made up facts. But they couldn't do that convincingly. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. But there's a point of law. Because the Lord Jesus Christ rose. And the Bible tells us that if the Lord Jesus Christ rose, then he became the first fruits of those that sleep. The Bible talks about a promise of life eternal. It talks about a new world order that is organised according to the commandments of God, that is under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul sets out in his letter to the Corinthians a legal argument. Chapter 15 and verse 1. You see, what does Paul present? Paul presents the risen Lord Jesus Christ, not as a, as a fanciful idea, but as a legal fact. He says, first and foremost in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, what I'm telling you is what I received. So I'm telling you, I'm preaching to you what I believe, what I received, and I, I stand on these facts. And he says, this is rather different because in verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if, conditional, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, that is, unless you believe in vain, in which case there is no value. So how you respond to the scriptures is key. They can bring salvation if you remember and observe, but if you, if you forget and move on, well, there's not much salvation there. The Bible talk about sins, about salvation, is geared around sins being forgiven and eternal life being granted in the kingdom that God has promised. So, going back to the facts, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So he's repeating himself, the consistency is there. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So that's the point I've already made. I've made two or three occasions about the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling prophecy. So he died for our sins, verse 3. But verse 4, he was buried and he rose again. So this is where it gets a little bit extreme. This is not normal. People don't rise from the dead. But Paul says it with conviction. And he also says it with authority. This also was according to the scriptures. And he was um, seen by people. Ah, that's interesting. Not two or three lying false witnesses on the basis of which Jesus was crucified. But he was seen by Cephas. Not only one person. No legal credibility. He was seen of the twelve. Okay, <coughs> more convincing. Then he was seen of 500 people. Okay, that's really convincing. Can I speak to some of these people? Yes, you can. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians that many of these people are still alive. And if you want to go and see them, well, go and talk to them now because some have started to die. They're getting older. So there's the evidence, the legal conviction with which Paul believed. And he con corresponded the substance of that belief. So verse 6, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then the apostles. And then he was also seen of Paul. And as Paul said, I'm telling you what I've received, what I've seen. And that's what I base my faith on. So the risen Lord had plenty of supporting witnesses. And at that time, with no CNN, no BBC 24-7 news, this was the only way that you could establish fact and proof. An eyewitness. Not just one, but many. Several hundred. And they were still there to go and talk to. And if you wanted to, the world was sufficiently small to be able to do that just. 
So where do I stand? I stand in the same list of people who are convinced that this is a factual occurrence. It was prophesied. It came to pass. And there were eyewitnesses who were able to corroborate the person making the statement. So what do we see then? <coughs> Verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. I laboured more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So, there is the abundant evidence. How do we react to that? Because now we're talking about grace. That is God's gift. He can dispense it as he sees fit. It involves labour, work. And if we wish to believe, then we can be part of, as it says in verse 20, and verse 21 and 22. Now is Christ risen from the dead. He has become the first fruits of those that sleep. Since by man came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. So, what do we say then? In conclusion, quite simply, there's, as I feel, divine evidence of creation. The psalmist, Albert Einstein, and I am willing to exceed that. It's whether you are willing to allow for a creator in your consideration of life. We can trust the scriptures as God's inspired word. We have evidence that it hasn't changed, that it was written before the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have the prophecies that it contains that were evidenced in the life, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was sufficient to be able to be the substance of a Hebrew lawyer, Paul. And he was able to see that and change his life as a consequence. Are we willing to change our lives as a same consequence? Because that time of a kingdom to come, which we've just read about in 1 Corinthians, was the subject of the conversation as the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the earth to heaven. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us that, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven, well, he's going to come back. He's going to come back in exactly the same way that he's gone, as you saw him go. So the question then is, you've got your three principles of faith. Those are mine. I don't know what yours are. They may be the same. They may be different. But I think it's important that you're able to, to anchor your faith so a coherent argument that I think is supported strongly. We can look at it in many different ways with many more, more evidence points. Those are just some simple ones from my rather simple and rather tired brain. But I pray that you are able to look at the scriptures and make a similar statement of faith.